Well, hey, everybody. Today we are kicking off a brand new series called Don't Waste Your Life. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in the book of Revelation today and throughout this series. But I want to start by talking about our most precious resource that we have, and that is our time. And it could be right now you disagree because you're looking at gas prices and grocery prices and you're going, no, I'm pretty sure money is our most precious resource and we seem to be running out of it. Let me tell you this, you're gonna run out of time before you run out of money. Because you can make more money, but you cannot make more time. And one day, you and I, we're gonna stand before Jesus and the reality is how we spend our time is how we spend our life and we will give account for how we spent our time with this one and only life that you and I have. And so the goal of this series, as we look at the teachings of Jesus, the goal of the series is that we would take his words and we would apply them in our lives so that you and I, we wouldn't waste our lives. Because with the time that we have, the reality is all of us are using that time for something. And now, I don't know if maybe it's just me, anybody here has ever woken up one day and looked at an area of their life. Could be they looked at their friendships. They looked at the people that they were hanging out with. And maybe you've asked this question, how did I end up here? Could be that in your finances, you were looking at them one day and you asked the question, how did I, how did I end up here? Could be in your thought life, could be in habits, could be in your parenting, could be in your marriage. If you're a student, it could be you got to the end of the year and you looked at your grades and you thought to yourself, how did I get here? And the answer to that question is you took a path. You took a path that eventually led you there. Sometimes we think life is just, you know, a couple major decisions. Uh, That's not how life typically works. When you find yourself going, how did I end up over here? It wasn't that you just made one decision and you ended up over there. It's that you made little decision after little decision after little decision, and it it took you down a path. Then one day you wake up and you go, man, how did this this happen? Just this week, my wife and I, uh, we, we had one of these weeks where for a few days, we were just butting heads on everything. And it seemed like our our words were sarcastic and a little bit jabbing towards each other. And both of us, the only thing we were 100% certain of is that it was the other person's fault. Anybody relate to what I'm talking about right now? And and we just kept butting heads. And then we started to ask the question, how did we get here? Like, how, how did this happen? And the reality is it wasn't that there was like one major thing. It was a bunch of little decisions. And all of a sudden we found ourselves down this path. See, the reality of a path is you don't realize that you're on a path, typically until you're way down that path. And the right path and the wrong path, the tricky thing is they kind of run parallel to each other for a while. And so you might feel like you're going down the, the right path, but again, so subtly, without you realizing it, it begins to veer off. And after little decision after little decision, you wake up one day and you go, what happened to my marriage? What happened to my life? Why are these habits such a regular thing? And and it was little decision after little decision. So this week, my wife and I, the reason I'm telling the story, by the way, is because we resolved it. Otherwise, I'd tell you a story from like a month ago. (laughs) But we realized we're on the wrong path. And, And it wasn't until we began to own our own part in it and to ask for forgiveness and to offer forgiveness, to grant that to each other, that, that we were able to get back onto the right path. Throughout this series, Jesus is gonna challenge us in regards to which path that we are on. And in love and in grace and also in truth, Jesus is gonna invite us back onto the right path. He's gonna speak truth in ways that for some of us, it's gonna be a little bit uncomfortable, uh, but he's doing it because he loves us and he wants to help us, but he's gonna guide us back to the right path. All throughout scripture, you have different Themes And one of the themes is this, this idea of a path. And that you and I, we get to make choices in life and those choices will take us a certain direction. 
If you look at the very beginning of your Bible, it begins with the story of Adam and Eve, the account of what happened in the Garden of Eden, and God gives them a choice. You can choose to trust me, you can choose to follow me, and in that, you're gonna experience the blessing. The blessing of this garden and all that it has to offer and to co-rule with me in creation, God invites them to walk this path, but he says, but you also have a choice, you could choose to reject me. You could choose to go down this other path and experience the curse and the destruction that comes with that. And, and of course, the story goes, it chose the wrong path. Throughout the Old Testament, you have the nation of Israel, and this theme is recurring where God's saying, okay, you can trust in me, you can follow me down this path and experience the blessing and the life that I have for you, or you can reject me, you can turn to false gods, you can turn these other directions, trust in yourself, whatever it is, and experience destruction, and, and you have a choice as to what path you go down, and again and again. The nation of Israel, they choose to go down the wrong path and they repent and they go, okay, God, we're gonna follow you and then they go off the path and they repent and this just happens again and again and again throughout the Old Testament. It's a major theme of the Bible. If I were to take all of the Bible and I were to say, okay, what, what is the big choice that we have throughout all of scripture, the, the big meta-narrative choice that you and I will make is whether or not we're gonna choose to trust and follow Jesus or whether we're gonna go down a different path. Last week, we wrapped up a series talking about the gospel, the good news that Jesus has made a way, he's made a path for us. Yet some of us, we choose our own good works. We choose some other thing rather than trusting in Jesus. The invitation is to trust him, and not just with heaven and eternity, but in all the details of the here and now, in all these different areas of our lives, and some of our choices are gonna take us down a path of experiencing the abundant life that Jesus promises. Some of our choices will take us down a path of destruction. And in love and in grace, Jesus is going to, to guide us to the right path in the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation, for some people, gets them real freaked out. Uh, because in Revelation, which is the last book in your Bible, it's a picture of things that are to come in the end times. And so some people read through, and there's all kinds of symbolism and pictures, and there's like a dragon, and, and some people are like, I don't understand. And so people have debated for 2,000 years all the exact meanings of all these things, and some people get real scared, and then they read these books on the end times, and, and they're gonna be walking, and someone's gonna disappear, and so they're freaked out about that. And if ever, it, like I grew up in a church where uh, like it was supposed to be this really scary thing, to, you know, what's gonna happen in the end? And so I was overwhelmed and I'd walk into a room that I thought my mom was gonna be in and she wasn't there. And so I was like, I missed it, I missed the rapture, you know? And every time I'd go anywhere and there was somebody that was supposed to be there and they weren't there, I'd get all freaked out. Well, let me just help you out and give you the, the bottom line of Revelation. The big picture of the book of Revelation is this, Jesus wins. Without getting into all the symbolism, without getting into all of that, there's a lot of things we could agree on. There's a lot of things we could debate on. Uh, let me just tell you the goal, the purpose, the reason why we have the book of Revelation is so that you and I might know that in the end, Jesus wins. Jesus is victorious. And those who put their trust, those who put their hope in Jesus, they share in that victory. And so the book of Revelation, it's not meant to freak us out. It's actually meant to give us peace in the midst of chaos in the midst of uncertainty, when things are, are challenging. And John, who's given this vision of what's to come in the end times, he's gonna be the one writing this down. He's gonna give us a depiction of Jesus in Revelation chapter one. So today we're gonna look at Revelation one. Uh, over the next several weeks, we'll be in Revelation chapter two and chapter three, and we're just gonna go verse by verse through this section of, of scripture. But John is receiving this revelation in a time of great persecution, in a time of great suffering. He writes this, verse nine. I, John... And John's one of the original disciples, original followers of Jesus. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So John is the last remaining of the original disciples. As he's writing this, as he's receiving this vision, he's in his old age. All of his friends, the other disciples, they have been murdered for their faith in Jesus for declaring that they had seen the resurrected Jesus. They were threatened and they did not stand down when they were told to denounce that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior. They proclaimed it and all of them were murdered for their faith in Jesus except for John who was exiled to the island of 
Patmos. Now, I have a map here, and on the map, you'll see on the bottom left, a little arrow pointing to that island. It's a very small, very desolate island off of Asia Minor. And from there, John's gonna receive this vision, but basically, he's in prison. He's not allowed to leave this island, and he's to live out the rest of his years and and die on the island of Patmos. So he's receiving this vision in a time of great suffering and persecution. Verse 10, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, and I heard behind me, so he's having this vision. It says, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These seven churches, again on that map, they were in a, a circle on this trade route, and so the letter would go out from the island of Patmos, and and the scroll would be read, this revelation of what's to come. That's why we call it revelation. This revelation would be read out loud at all of these churches. And you'll see there kind of in a circle, these seven churches, the number seven in the Bible is a number of completion. Theologians believe that means that these seven churches represent all churches for all time, that it's symbolic of all the churches that would would exist for all time. So these letters are to be, to, read, to be read, this letter of Revelation is to be read to these seven churches. Verse 12, so he hears this from behind. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And he's about to give us the vision of what he saw. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Think Niagara Falls. Think overwhelming, roaring of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. If you haven't picked up, this is not your Sunday school Jesus. This is not your sweet little sitting there holding a baby lamb Jesus if you grew up in church or in Sunday school. See, a lot of times when we think of Jesus, we picture Jesus as we imagine he was as he walked this earth. John is receiving this vision of Jesus glorified in heaven. And it's not Sunday school Jesus. In fact, in Revelation 19, there's a similar depiction of Jesus and it describes what he looks like. And he's riding on this white horse and he has these many crowns and his robe is dipped in blood and the armies of heaven are behind him also riding on horses and written on his robe and tatted up on his thigh. It says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you're like, is he really tatted up? It's not clear in the Greek, but I can't imagine on his thigh. It was like one of those like water things that you peel off. I imagine and, you know, it's probably more like he's had it up on his thigh. But this is not Sunday school Jesus. This is terrifying, glorious, overwhelming, awe-inspiring Jesus. And John is seeing this vision. And John, who's one of the disciples who was with Jesus while he walked this earth, humanly speaking, is now receiving this vision. And it's very different because look at John's reaction. Jesus is his friend. They have a close relationship. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He's terrified. He's overwhelmed. But look what Jesus does. Then he, talking about Jesus, placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. So Jesus' words to John, like the roaring of powerful waters, is, John, don't be afraid. Why is that? Because John, through his faith in Jesus, just as Jesus is victorious, in the end Jesus wins, so also John is victorious through faith in him. 
that Jesus' victory is John's victory. So Jesus says, John, don't be afraid. Jesus goes on and he explains the symbolism of the seven stars and seven lampstands. The seven stars are seven angels. Some translations, uh, messengers. It's the same word for angels and messengers to the seven churches. And the seven lampstands represent the seven churches that we just saw on the map. And in essence, Jesus is going to go to each one of these churches and he's going to preach a prophetic sermon and he's gonna give them his review. So each church in a different geological location geographical location is also in a different spiritual location. And so Jesus is about to speak truth of where each church is at. He's giving his review. Now, I share a personal story with you. Uh, several years ago, I wrote a book with a mentor of mine and I published it on Amazon and just a couple days later, I got my first review. And I actually took a screen grab of it because I was like, oh man, four stars which you might be thinking, man, four stars, that's, that's pretty good. You know, that's like an 80%. I'm like, man, four stars. And I was devastated that it wasn't five stars. And the reason that it was so difficult for me to receive this four-star review, not only was it my first review that I got on this book, guys, it was my mom. <laughs> I can't make this up. And so I called her up and I'm like, mom, what are you doing? And she said, I thought it was a really good book. I said, why did you give it four stars then? And she's like, well, you know, I think it could be better. <laughs> and then she, she proceeds to tell me on, you know, you could have done this, you could have added that. You know, I wish at the end, you know, the summaries. You know. And, and she told me all the things that could be better, but she was just brutally honest with me. Uh, real quick, to all the moms in the room watching online, wherever you are, if your son ever writes a book, automatically five stars. <laughs> it's an unspoken rule, but I'm just gonna speak it out loud right now. Automatic five stars. But my mom gives me four stars. If we could pull that up again. Here was the, here was the other thing. As I'm on the phone, I'm like, look, if you look at the bottom, one person found this helpful. I'm like, mom, somebody's already read your review. You gotta take this down. Uh, she, she tried, but Amazon's like, no, we're keeping this. They figured it out. And so I, I still have a four-star review from my mom and I'm in therapy. But anyhow, the reason I share that story <laughs> is because Jesus is essentially about to do the same thing. He's gonna go to each church and he's gonna give a review. And in that review, he's gonna be brutally honest. But the difference for these churches is their book's not done being written. Does this make sense? So Jesus' review is this. He's gonna say, okay, here's where you are on the path. He's gonna give a commendation to each church, except for there's gonna be an exception there. It's gonna give a commendation to each church. Here's where you're on the path. Here's where you're doing things the right way. Here, here's where you are on the path that leads to blessing, that leads to life to the fullest. And he's also gonna give a correction. So here's where you're on the path. Here's where you have began to veer off of the path. Here, here's where you are missing it, whether you realize it or not. And for some of the churches, they're completely clueless that they veered off the path. And with that, Jesus is inviting them back. And in that, he's inviting us back to the path that leads to life abundant, to the path that leads to what you and I were created for. And so he's gonna give the reviews, he's gonna invite people back, and he's gonna explain, if you continue down this path that's veering off, here, here are the consequences that, that come with that. That's gonna lead you to destruction, and he's gonna go on to explain it, but if, if you'll change your trajectory, if you'll get back on the right path, here's gonna be the, the consequences that are positive. See, these books aren't done being written yet, and so they still have time. Listen, if you are here right now and you are hearing my voice, there is still sand in your hourglass, there is still time for your story to change. Your book is not done being written. And so the invitation, it's not just for the churches, the invitation is for us. Now there's a tension that exists here that I wanna acknowledge. You and I, we are not saved by our good deeds, by our effort, by our works. We are saved by grace through faith. We just did an entire series talking about that. And so it's about the grace of God. It's about what Jesus has done for us, not what we do for ourselves. We are saved by grace. Yet at the same time, our choices matter. 
that our choices are leading us down a path. And Jesus's invitation is to still put forth effort in following him. And so, yes, on the one hand, there's grace and we're saved by grace. On the other hand, there's truth and there's the reality that if we choose the wrong path, we will experience the consequences of the wrong path. And so that means as followers of Jesus, our effort is not earning us anything. Our effort is in response to the grace, but our effort still matters because we don't wanna waste our life. We only have one. So we wanna be wise in how we live. We wanna be wise with whatever time it is that we have remaining. We wanna utilize the most precious resource that we have, and we wanna walk the right path. Grace is opposed to earning, but it is not opposed to effort. And so Jesus is gonna invite us not to waste our lives by working towards the right path. Now, if you're here, you're listening online and you've you've been on the wrong path for a long time. And you know you've been on the wrong path. It's not that that you've subtly just, you know, kind of wandered off and you're, you're not quite aware of it yet. You know that you've been on the wrong path for a long time. I wanna encourage you. It's not too late. You can't change the past. And I know all of us, every single one of us in the room, all of us, we have things in our past that we regret. We have things that we've done. We have things that we haven't done. We have things that we've said. We have things that we haven't said. And and we have regrets over those things. And the reality is, you and I, we can't go back and change the past. I have those things in my life. We can't go back and change the past, but we can choose by God's grace to redeem the present. To redeem means to regain possession, to restore back to its original purpose, to get our lives back onto the right path by the grace of God, by the help of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit working within us. You and I are empowered by the Spirit to get off the wrong path and onto the right path. And that you and I were to live our lives with the end in mind And in light of how the story ends, we can live with that clear purpose. And again, to kind of sum up Revelation, in the end, Jesus wins. And based on how the story ends, we can know with confidence that in the end, all that matters is God and people. We say that all the time as a church. It's completely true. When you read Revelation, when you read how the story ends, everything else fades away and is made new. But in the end, here's here's what lasts for eternity, God and people. Even the earth itself will be made new again. So you and I, we can live our lives with purpose and the path Jesus is inviting us to, the path of purpose, the path of abundant life is a path of loving God and loving people. To use the time that we have remaining to love God and to love people. And this path is one that's not limited to, but it does include giving and serving. Part of the path that God has for you and has for me is that our lives wouldn't be about ourselves that our lives would be about the people around us. See, Jesus modeled this. Jesus said, his own words, he says, I didn't come here to be served, but to serve. And to give my life as a ransom for many. For God so loved the world that he, he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, Jesus, he gave and he served as followers of Jesus. The model that he set forth for us, the invitation that he's giving us and he's giving the churches as we walk through Revelation 2 and 3 is a life of giving and serving. And here's a great irony. When you and I give and when you and I serve, it actually blesses us. I remember when I first started serving in elementary school as a junior hire, I thought, man, I'm gonna go help these kids as a junior hire with all my great wisdom and understanding of life and how it worked. I'm gonna go help these kids. And I remember going, man, this is amazing. And I'm building friendships and, and I'm, I'm actually enjoying serving others. That there was something within my soul that began to, to awaken 
in serving others. And then as a high schooler, I would serve with junior hires in elementary. And then in college, I would serve with students. And it's this path that God led me down. And still, I continue walking that path to this day. And there was this season in college where I'm like, you know what? I'm done serving other people. I'm just gonna serve myself. And let me just let you in on a little secret. It's the most miserable I've ever been in my life. And if you've ever experienced life when it was all about you, you've been more miserable than you can ever imagine in that season. But when you begin to serve others, you begin to experience this blessing and following in the path of Jesus. And it's counterintuitive. So recently we sat down with a few individuals who are experiencing this in their own lives and we just began to ask them questions and wanted to share their story with you. My friend Nora was volunteering with Junior High First and so she invited me to come and try it out. I actually started serving with security a gentleman who was leading our small group uh, asked me, hey, we need an extra counselor. So Jason, who leads the children's ministry at Queen Creek, happened to call, and he's looking for people to serve within four, five, six. Someone approached me about serving, and I was like, sure, that'd be great. And also, I'm a single mom, and I wanted to not just talk about serving with my son, but also model it. I always think God has a sense of humor because he took two people who don't have kids and would never have thought of serving in this area because of that if someone hadn't invited us. Just thinking back to high school, how impactful leaders were to me, if I can just be one helpful step along the way to, to meeting and knowing and following Jesus, uh, then I wanna be there for that. There's a young boy that's in my small group. He constantly challenges me with questions and humbling me in a sense and having me think really thoroughly about my faith. When you're talking about God and they finally understand, they lean into the conversation and you see that light bulb go off in there, I mean, that makes, that makes it all worth it. Another girl came up to me, she said, Miss Rachel, Miss Rachel, I have to tell you something, I have to tell you something. And I was like, what? I thought it was something at school. And she whispered in my ear, I said yes to Jesus. So we celebrated and we danced and we cheered and that's like one of my biggest favorite memories when I get those stories. I'm taking what I learned at 456 and how I communicate about Jesus and what he's done for me and just taking that to other men that I know and my faith has just grown even stronger because of that. And so I have three kids and when my kids come to Sun Valley as high schoolers, my hope and prayer is that uh, there would be leaders here that can say, we want to help you find Jesus. We know your parents love you and care about you, uh, but let us be able to foster that as well and that we can all find uh, Christ together. If you're thinking about serving, just take the step and do it. I promise you'll be hooked, you will love it. You may change the trajectory of a, of a kid that you will never see because maybe they grow up, they go through a phase, they, they kind of lose sight of things, but they remember those moments that bring them back. You're never gonna be perfect, um, and you don't need to be. But Jesus is what brings us together. You don't need to wait anymore. Um, you're ready right now. God's gonna put you where he wants you and use you in whatever capacity. So. But plus, it's incredibly fun. Yeah. It's incredibly it's fun. fun with kids. It would come have fun with us. <laughs> Can we thank those who shared their story? Uh, so right now, as we speak, there's hundreds of junior hires from Sun Valley at a camp, and some of those leaders you just saw are there at the camp with them. And uh, one of those junior hires is my kid. And I just have to say, I am so grateful for other adults who are gonna speak truth and speak wisdom into the life of my son, where because I'm dad, he might be like, dad doesn't know what he's talking about. But when some other adult says it, all of a sudden it's like, wow, it's brilliant. Dad, you should have heard what somebody said. I'm like, you know, I talk to people for like a living and like I, I, I share things from God's word. And he's like, whatever, it was so smart when this guy said it. And there's just something about having another adult speaking in the life of your kids. And, and for some of us in the room, uh, we are that other adult that another family needs, that another parent needs. I love what Dakota said. We said, my kids are gonna grow up in high school and I hope that there's somebody uh, to, to be there for my kids. Our full name is Sun Valley Community Church. And, and that word community means something. 
uh, because it really is about all of us using the gifts God's given us to serve, to be a part of, of what he's doing in and through the, the ministry of Sun Valley. We celebrated earlier all those who have said yes to Jesus. Uh, that's only because Sun Valley, you give, you serve, that that's possible. That God's using you, he's using your gifts to help people meet him. Uh, for some of us, we've, we've been hesitant, and I get it. It's, it can be overwhelming to take that first step into serving. And so here, here's what I wanna ask everyone to do is to consider maybe taking just one step, maybe not a huge step, that direction. To take one step to say, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try serving one time. Not gonna commit, you know, every week for the rest of my life, but I'll, I'll serve one time. And I know it's summer and a lot of us, you know, are gonna be traveling and in and out. And so it could be that this summer, you just pick one weekend, one time, and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna try it and just see what God does. And maybe something's gonna awaken within your soul. Maybe you're gonna begin to see things differently and realize that, that God has a different path for you. And so as you exit uh, today out in the lobby on your way out, there's gonna be signups out on the patios uh, where you can sign up to serve just one time. Again, they're not a lifelong commitment. If you're like, after that one time, you're like, oh, that was terrible, I don't wanna do it again. Okay, uh, just try one time. And if you're watching online, you can go to serve.sv.cc and you can sign up there. But just take that one step and see what God does. It could be that there's something that, that God's created you for and it, it's time to step into that and to experience the blessing of following him. Uh, over the course of this series, we're not just gonna talk about serving. If you're like, is that what we're doing every week in this series? No, again, it's a part of following Jesus, but it's not limited to just that. Throughout this series, we're gonna be looking at what Jesus says to these seven churches and in that, what he says to you and to me on how we can get back onto the right path. Uh, to be real blunt, for some of us, this is gonna be the most important series of the entire year for us. Because it's gonna be through the words of Jesus as he speaks graciously, but also truthfully. As he invites us to get back onto the right path. For some of us, this is gonna be the time that we get back on the right path in an area of our lives that maybe we didn't realize we had even veered off. So I'm gonna ask you to commit to being a part of the service every week. If you're traveling, we have church online. Don't miss a weekend because each weekend we're gonna be looking at a different thing that Jesus speaks to us. Going just verse by verse through these two chapters that are incredibly practical, incredibly helpful to guide you and to me to not waste our lives, but to invest whatever time we have left in what matters most. So be all in. I know it's summertime. And let's see what God does. Would you pray for with me, God, for each one of us here. God, I believe wholeheartedly that you've called us to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Jesus, yours is the victory. Jesus, it's because of you and what you've done, uh, but you invite us to share in that victory with you, and you also invite us to share in the work, in the here and now. God, thanks for all the leaders who are at junior high camp right now. I pray your blessing over them. I pray that they would get rest, whether it's at camp or when they get home from camp. And God, I pray for each of those junior hires that this would be a milestone moment that they would look back on and God, see where you got a hold of their lives as a junior hire and forever change their path. Uh, for those who are gonna be at four, five, six camp next week, high school camp the following week, in summer jam the week after that with our elementary school kids, God, I pray your blessing over those leaders. I pray your blessing over the adult volunteers and the student volunteers who are gonna plug in with the younger kids. God, may they experience the joy of trusting you and following you, investing their lives in what matters most. Jesus, we acknowledge in the end you win and all that matters is God and people. Would you help us to live our lives on purpose, with purpose, for what matters most? We love you. Jesus, thanks for loving us. It's in your precious name that we pray, amen.